all right i believe we have everything ready to get started and so i'd like to start by welcoming everyone to another webinar by jay scrambler uh, this time exploring the topic of mitigating mage cart web skimmers with a behavior-based solution with this in mind today we will be looking at this security threat and key business problem of web skimmers commonly known as mage cart we will dig into the current status of these attacks, the techniques used, and which strategies help minimize this risk. I want to start by letting you know that this webinar has been pre-recorded, so if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at hello at jscrambler.com and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, moving forward, uh, I want to present our speakers for the day. Uh, joining us, we have Pedro Fortuna, who is, of course, the CTO and co-founder of JScrambler, as well as Karin Azevedo, which is a pre-sales engineer also at JScrambler. So I'll go right ahead and move the floor over to Karin for her analysis of the current panorama of web skimming attacks. Uh, thanks for joining us, Karen, and feel free to take it away. Hello, everyone. Hi, Flippy. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you guys for joining us today. Well, my goal today is just to give a clear picture of MageCart web skimming attacks so that we can then explore different approaches to mitigate this threat. So first, clear explanation, and then the approaches. So I thought the best way to get started was with some headlines, because most people first hear about MageCart because of one of these stories. A huge enterprise that fell victim to a massive data breach and later on received the biggest DTPR fine ever. But the British Airways breach wasn't the peak for MageCart. Just recently, we've seen these cyber criminal groups breach companies like Claire's, Intersport, Fitness Depot, and Tupperware. And just a couple of weeks ago, we learned about eight US cities that also were breached by MageCart. These high profile web skimming attacks are getting more frequent, and the data shows us precisely this. According to RiskIQ, MageCart attacks have risen by 20% during the pandemic a time where we also saw a huge increase in online shopping. In the US, online shopping grew by around 49% in April alone, and certainly this volume has presented a unique opportunity for this type of attacks. Other research shows that there have been 2 million web skimming attacks so far, with 20,000 compromised websites. But probably the most important statistic is this last one. A web skimming attack remains active on average for 22 days before being detected and removed. We have seen some cases where six or more months go by without companies being aware that their websites are infected. That's huge. So another interesting fact among these high profile attacks is the average size of the affected companies. Attackers are successfully breaching multiple billion dollar companies. And in June alone, we saw several examples of this, which I have presented before. The outcome of these web skimming attacks will always vary depending on the dimension of the breach. But most frequently, they have a significant negative impact on the business, of course. One of the first problems after a mage car attack is the breach of compliance with strict data privacy regulations, uh, such as GDPR and CCP, for example. The British Airways breach resulted in a $230 million fine and showed that web schemers are a very real threat to the privacy and security of user data. Then we also have the payment card industry data security standard. Every merchant that accepts credit card payment must be in compliance with PCI DSS. And falling victim to a mage card attack also represents a breach in compliance. It's still in litigation, we have seen some of these high profile attacks being followed by a massive lawsuit of hundreds of millions of dollars. As affected customers, of course, look for restitution for the breach of their data. 
and companies affected by these data breaches are frequently received with backlash from customers and, of course, instant loss of trust due to negative publicity. While the actual impact in the business is difficult to measure, it is likely to do a long-lasting damage in lost sales. As these scheming attacks gained notoriety in recent months, we have seen specific alerts from the PCI Council warning about the growth in web skimming during the pandemic. And even the FBI has launched an alert back in November, if I'm not mistaken, seeking to raise awareness about these attacks and the threat they pose to online merchants. But how do mage car attacks typically operate? This image here by uh, RiskIQ shows the typical scenario of a web skimming attack. Here, as you can see, you have multiple cyber criminal groups that inject the malicious skimmer into the web page of an e-commerce store, either by directly gaining access to their target's website or by injecting the malicious code through a third party. When an end user submits the payment form in an infected website, the malicious code grabs this information and sends it to the drop server. Then, these credit cards are sold in dark web markets or used to reship products overseas. It may seem strange that such a complex operation is capable of flying under the radar of such well-established enterprises. But that's the main ingredient to MageCard's success, their ability to remain undetected. And this ability mostly comes from the attacker taking advantage of a security blind spot that most companies have. The typical website application contains a huge mashup of client-side code, frameworks and libraries that are used during the development of these platforms contains dozens of pieces of third-party code, creating such a long chain of code dependencies that companies don't really uh, have a way to know what code they are effectively running. What makes matters worse is the fact that a log of sensitive data passes through the client side at some point in time, meaning that this data will be at risk. More traditional security approaches, such as uh, server-side security or even firewall, they do not contemplate these client-side security weaknesses. And even browser security mechanisms are falling short to shield websites against possible attacks like web skimming. But let me go ahead and focus on the more dangerous approach to mage car attacks, those that originate from third parties. Like I mentioned earlier, this approach doesn't require breaching the first party server. So what we have here on the left is a typical website containing HTML and JavaScript. So let's assume that this is our own e-commerce platform, okay? Apart from our own code, we also have some external code like uh, iframes or scripts. An example of a script could be a live chat widget which is quite common in e-commerce platforms. But here on the right side, we have the actual attack. Our live chat widget uses a full JS file that contains basically the whole logic. But that code is itself dependent on a third-party code. In this case, we have a bar JS script that is part of the source code of our full JS live chat. In this attack scenario here, someone gained access to the bar.js repository and injected malicious code containing a web skimmer. Because this change can happen without any visibility from the provider of the chat widget, the malicious code will silently ship to all the users of this live chat, including, of course, our e-commerce platform. These types of skimmers typically perform multiple rejects checks to be able to infect as many payment forms as possible. I'll show you an example of this in just a minute. But now, let's look at what happens when one of our customers fills out a payment form. 
the malicious code will capture the submitted credit card data and send it to the attacker's drop server, in this case, coolestfonts.com. But attackers often go even further. So instead of sending the data out directly to the drop server, they first send it to the legitimate domain of the live chat provider, for example, and only then rely it to the attacker's drop server. This two-step process makes it even harder for us to know that something is wrong. Our website is running the code of a live chat widget, right? Like it always has. And then it is sending some data to the website of this provider, which is not suspicious at all. Now let's look at the real example of a schemer. Here we have this schemer used in the Inventa breach, which happened in 2018. As we can see, this code is highly obfuscated, a technique that attackers use to increase their ability to fly under the radar. After a complex, complex effort to deobfuscating this code, we find the second version. Now we can actually understand what the schemer did. First, starting from the bottom, the schemer contains some logic with regex checks to confirm that it is running in a payment page. And that's why we can see the terms order and checkout here. Then it iterates all buttons so that it can compromise the click event, adding event listeners to the click of those elements. Then it will get any element that is a form. And the same way that it compromises the click, it compromises the forms, using the same function to poison the submit event. Finally, after the attackers have been able to collect all data, they send a new outbound request to their drop server containing all this information, including the credit card details. In the eye of the end user, the payment will be processed normally without any indication that something went wrong. The schemer also contains additional logic to run this logic again in set intervals. This works like uh, a fail-safe logic kind of thing in case the schemer hadn't loaded correctly in the past attempt. So basically, it will keep on trying to run the attack until it's successful. So this might seem like a pretty sophisticated schemer, but as I will explain later, the most recent schemers have even more advanced logic that makes them much harder to detect. And so it's not really surprising that attackers are still winning this game, right? They don't need to breach a very secure server of their target. They can just go after the weakly secured server of their third or fourth party providers. And you may have noticed a big difference between this approach and the typical first party server breach. So in a first party breach, attackers can grab all the data of thousands of users at once, just like this. But web skimming is very different because it takes time. Credit card details are exfiltrated in each user session. So with enough time, attackers can infect thousands of user sessions and greatly increase their payout. This was precisely what happened to British Airways. In 15 days time, attackers stole over 380,000 credit cards. In other words, 18 credit cards per minute. Which means that we can basically summarize any web skimming attack with this formula, taking special attention to the count of our time in minutes and not days. Because if the average mage car attack stays active for 22 days before being detected, then we're talking about over 30,000 minutes. And each minute that goes by with an undetected schemer means a bigger and bigger problem to the business. All of this leads us to the billion dollar question. So how can companies turn the tide? Well, as we've seen, this doesn't look great for companies, right? 
So the last generation of web schemers are using very advanced techniques to avoid detection. Besides using obfuscation techniques to conceal their malicious code, they are actually using defense mechanisms to avoid being detected at all by bots, rendering many detection approaches useless. But the bottom line is fairly straightforward. Looking back at our formula, what companies need to do to effectively mitigate MageCard is to bring this second portion down to zero. In other words, companies need to detect and stop MageCard schemers in real time in order to avoid a breach. Okay, I know this all sounds great, but which specific strategies can businesses use to shield themselves against MageCard? Well, let's start by looking at some of the ones that are more frequently associated with MageCard. One of these is Subresource Integrity, or SRI for short. This approach allows you to add a parameter to a loaded script containing a hash, which corresponds to the checksum of the original file. So if the tiniest change occurs to the script, this checksum sorry, checksum will be different and SRI will prevent the script from loading, just like that. At first glance, this seems like an excellent approach to prevent mage card attacks that originate from third party like the example we saw before. However, there are some shortcomings to this approach. First, SRI is basically locking you to the specific version of these scripts. Any update will require changing this script tag and will typically mean that you will be dragging behind on versions. And in case, you know, in cases where you are using SRI for self-hosted files, there's also the case of attackers being able to modify the file system and removing the tag, you know, the entire tag altogether. A second popular approach is content security policy. So what CSP does is let you define which external sources your website can connect to. You whitelist the sources you trust and every other connection will basically be blocked. And you might already know CSP because it's frequently used to prevent cross-site scripting attacks. What is very interesting about CSP is that it can disable inline scripts and unsafe evolve. In theory, this could help us deal with some types of web scheming attacks. But there is a big problem with CSP. Some researchers have found out that 94% of first-generation CSPs can be bypassed. And even if we get past that, there's not much that CSP can do when it comes to third-party web scheming attacks. So let me go back to my example to show you what it means. Okay. So CSP works by blocking connections that are not whitelisted. But in this example, the schemers comes from a whitelisting domain. For example, a live chat provider. This means that CSP won't really block this connection. But what about blocking the connection when attackers send the data out? Well, when I showed this earlier, I mentioned that the attacker can find a way around this. They can first send the data to the legitimate server of the provider before really sending it out to their drop server. So again, CSP can't really do anything here when this happens. So CSP isn't really the right tool to prevent web skimming. There are just too many ways to exfiltrate data. Plus, CSP headers can also be stripped out by browser extensions. Okay, now let's move on to some lesser known approaches. And first, we have domain sinkholing. I won't really get into much detail about this approach because it's fairly complex, but it basically uses custom detection policies that look for code that appears to be skimming data. Once suspicious code is detected, it triggers a domain sinkholing process where it diverts the outbound request containing the exfiltrated data. So instead of sending the data to the drop server, it sends it out into a void or a sinkhole. But again, there are several drawbacks to this approach. And probably the most obvious one is that it is signature based, 
this is a big deal because we know that when the schema is obfuscated, it can break out of signatures. And another problem with signature based is that we keep seeing new approaches to web scheming attacks. So these new attacks won't be detected by these types of solutions. Let me now move on to another type of approach which relates to the usage of JavaScript virtualization. This one is one of the most promising approaches to effectively tackle web skimmers. So it isolates every piece of third-party code inside an iframe and filters events based on a static whitelist. But the problem of JavaScript virtualization is not its raw capability of mitigating image card attacks. Even if you manage to get it working right, which is very tricky, I must say, it can very easily introduce a new race condition and start breaking things, potentially ruining the experience of your users. And there is also another detail that we must consider. Because the logic of the solution will have to run on the client side, it will be exposed to temper attempts and bypass. So the solution must be hardened with resilient code protection. So what does all of this tell us? Well, first, browser security by itself is surely not enough. There are all these different techniques that have many strengths to them. And so we should try maybe to leverage a combination of sandboxing, poisoning detection, and down tempering detection. It must be capable of doing both static and dynamic JavaScript analysis. And even use the best possible deobfuscation techniques to uncover obfuscated schemers. Finally, it must include resilient code protection to prevent tempering attempts. And so you may have noticed a changing approach here. Instead of trying to prevent the infection itself, we're talking about it changing the mindset. And we like to call this approach behavior-based mitigation. But well, for more on that, I will hand the floor over to Pedro Fortuna. Thank you, Karen. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as a security researcher, I've been actively engaged in understanding how these attacks work. Uh, but more important than that, I've been working on technical solutions that can help companies mitigate this type of attacks. Um, and, and that led to this uh, behavior-based mage card mitigation approach um, that basically departs from the assumption that sooner or later your web application will be breached. There are simply too many ways in um, considering the average number of dependencies that web applications have. So the approach becomes detecting and blocking a web schema at runtime. And the best approach for doing that is by monitoring the behavior of the code running in the, inside the web application. So a web schema will always show signs of malicious activity. For example, if we see a live chat script running in a checkout page, and accessing the payment form, then that's obviously a behavior that tells us that something is wrong. Or if we see a previously unseen script running in some or even all of our user sessions, that's certainly uh, something that we'll want to investigate uh, because it could potentially be a web schemer. Uh, or if we see data going out to an unknown domain, this might be a sign of potentially malicious activity. Um, uh, these are just a few ex basic examples, but I'll explore a couple of more advanced scenarios in, in a minute. Detecting is important, but even more important is the ability to block the malicious behavior. Um, this is the only way to actually mitigate the web scheming attack. But for this to be effective, the blocking must be done in real time, regardless of the script that is showing that behavior or what browser and device is being used. Uh, it should also be granular because we want to be precise in blocking just the malicious behaviors. We don't want to block uh, more than what we should. And finally, it should provide good actionable data 
for the incident response teams or for the SOC teams to understand where the attack came from and to do the final cleanup. Our solution, Web Page Integrity, is based on the principles that I've just presented. Um, this solution puts a JavaScript agent in every user session, combines multiple detection and protecting techniques. We look for DOM changes, uh, form hooking, code poisoning, suspicious network accesses, etc. Uh, it doesn't rely on detection signatures, but on detecting behaviors. So new forms of web skimming attacks are also detected. And finally, a very important aspect, um, it is the only solution in the market that includes resilient code protection, which uh, makes the solution unique because it's the only one capable of defending itself from tampering uh, attacks uh, from the web schemers. Now that I've covered how we handle detection, let's see how we block malicious activity. We use a strategy based on permission levels. Um, so for the first level, we control whether or not a certain script uh, is allowed to load or if it should be blocked. Um, at the second level, we allow uh, our customers to control um, the behaviors of scripts based on high-level assumptions uh, about what, what they should do. And the third level, they have the finest grain of control of every uh, tiny action that the script is performing. Let me give you some actual examples. For instance, uh, as a user of web page integrity, um, I would have the ability to block or alert if a script is installing an onSubmit event handler, which is very typical of web scheming attacks. Um, I could also block any type of connection that tries to send data out to a previously unknown domain, um, or if uh, specific methods are used to send that data out, like web sockets. Um, blocking any script that does anything to a specific payment form, uh, so I can, we can actually um, set which scripts are allowed to touch the payment form and which scripts aren't allowed to do that. Um, and by combining some of these rules, we can get uh, to a point where we have a very strict control of the behavior that we allow in our website without breaking things or compromising the user experience. Moving on, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to mention one of our most recent success stories, uh, which is a, a major airline that came to us for uh, mitigating Magecart, uh, basically wanting to prevent becoming the next British Airways. So they wanted to know if any of their scripts changed behavior and to have the ability of blocking any web skimming attempts. They wanted to, this to have minimal impact on the performance, uh, as that is directly tied to, to their revenues. And finally, they wanted the ability to send information uh, to their CM. They implemented web page integrity successfully, using our behavior-based detection and behavior control to actively detect and mitigate any type of schemer. Uh, and our approach passed all of their detection tests. Uh, they also use our inventory of scripts and network events to get a clear picture of their platform at any given time, and our dashboards allow them to quickly see any malicious behavior and where it comes from. We transitioned from a POC to a production environment without any hiccups and they specifically mentioned the value of being able to easily integrate the solution with um, zero or, or, or um, minimal impact. So we covered a lot of ground today. Karen gave us a, a snapshot of the current state of web scheming attacks, uh, w which is showing clear signs of growth. Um, these attacks are still um, a significant cost to affected companies, not just in fines, but also in reputation loss and, and therefore 
uh, sales losses. Uh, but why does this still happen? Um, well, because companies have a security blind spot in regards to the client side. They don't really know what is happening there, what scripts are running, and this allows web schemers to remain active for weeks. Um, during that time, they can exfiltrate thousands and thousands of credit cards with, without companies or even end users being aware of, of the attack. So Karen also explained why approaches like CSP and SRI and others fall short when it comes to mitigating these web schemers, especially because they, they keep evolving their tactics and, and bypassing these protections. Uh, there are simply too many ways in for attackers to execute malicious code on the web applications. Um, we have no other option uh, than assuming that our uh, web application will eventually be breached and malicious uh, code will be executing uh, inside of it. Uh, and when that happens, our best shot is to detect the attack in real time, not because we have a signature for the attack, but because we recognize the malicious behaviors and be able to block it. So we have delivered this behavior-based approach to a major airline and to major retailers who now have protection against MageCart with JScrambler web page integrity. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro and Karen, for your detailed explanation of this, um, of this topic. I want to remind everyone that you'll receive an email with our info sheet on preventing mage card attacks, which gives an in-depth explanation of what we discussed here today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any specific questions, of course, feel free to reach out to us uh, using the email you see here. And in case you'd like to discuss the, the possibility of doing a POC, uh, send us an email and we'll get back to you very soon. Well, I think that's it from me. I hope that everyone out there is staying safe and I look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Thanks everyone for joining us today and bye for now.